Hello, friends. Welcome back to the show. Today in the studio, I sat down next to the man mountain, Eben Britton, a former NFL O lineman turned yogi, truth seeker, spiritual bro. This is full of insightful gems of wisdom from a guy that transcended to the highest levels of the sport and had everything that comes with that, the fame, the money, the success, but also hit rock bottom afterwards and had to piece himself back together without the identity of being a famous football player. We talk about all kinds of stuff, how to find meaning in life, how to really deal with challenges and find faith and keep moving forward despite life putting you on your butt. What it's like to meet Mike Tyson in real life. Who's gonna win between Mike Tyson and Jake Paul? We talk about spirituality. We talk about what to do and habits to thrive. Eben is just a gem of a human and I think you're really gonna enjoy the show. Let's get into it. Eben, welcome to the show, my friend. It's good to have you in studio. How are we doing today? Dude, I'm excellent. Thank you for having me. I mean, perfect day out there. Perfect day. But we're in here. We're in here. Perfect day for a podcast. Good to meet a new brother. Yes. Spend some time. I already feel like we've known each other for a lifetime. Yeah. And uh, I'm excited for this, man. Thank you. Me too, dude. I think uh, when I came across you a couple of years ago at this point and then Mm. started to listen to the podcast and watching your journey and just feeling the the full journey of like the NFL to the yogi to everything that you do these days, there was a lot of God nods along the way, a lot of resonance to my story. I grew up in England, so we definitely didn't play that kind of football. (laughs) We played the the actual football, you know, where you kick it with your feet. Uh But, you know, just just been really cool to watch from afar your journey and now to sit down and have this chat. I'm super excited for it. So setting up the backstory a little bit, tell us a little bit about the journey from, from NFL to yogi and anything that comes up for you there. Yeah. That's a good, that's a good question. Good place to start. Um, I had this dream to play in the NFL when I was about eight years old, sitting in my grandparents' living room, watching the news, the Jets and the Giants in training camp, watching these massive gladiators in this violent ballet, dancing across a field, smashing into each other at a thousand miles an hour. Mm -hmm. I thought to myself, that's what I want to do when I grow up, you know? And uh, I've said this a thousand times, um, and it's an important piece of my story. There was a lot of chaos in my childhood, a lot of alcoholism, a lot of mental health issues. And so I looked at football as this vehicle to transcend that, Mm -hmm. to get myself out of it. Um, and there was a lot of good too. I mean, I was surrounded by a lot of people who told me I could be anything when I grew up, you know, I could do and achieve anything I wanted to do and be, uh, in my life. And so I took that finally my freshman year of high school, my mom would never allow me to play football until my freshman year of high school. Mm. Finally, I convinced her with the help of my dad to let me play. And it was just this rocket ship to the moon of everything I did, how I carried myself, how I lived, how I breathed, how I ate, how I trained, was all in alignment with achieving this dream of playing professional football. And uh, finally I did that. I made it happen in 2009. I was drafted 39th overall by the Jacksonville Jaguars. Wow. Uh, Spent six years in the NFL, had a handful of Pretty significant injuries, dislocated my shoulder, torn labrum, ruptured disc in my back, uh, excruciating sciatic nerve pain, torn muscles and ligaments all over my body, handful of concussions, myriad subconcussive hits, et cetera, et cetera. The the laundry list that Mm. every pro football player has (laughs) by the end. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so I came out of my football career and for for simplicity's sake, I was physically, mentally, and emotionally destroyed. And I had really done that to myself through this needing to validate my worth, needing to validate how big and strong and scary and worthy Mm. of recognition and success I was through the game of football and destroyed myself in the process of trying to prove that to the world. And so I had to go on this really slow, arduous journey of picking up the pieces and putting myself back together again. Um, and 
so, and that took many forms that football came to an end for me in 2014, moved back to Los Angeles from Chicago. I played four years in Jacksonville, two years in Chicago with the bears. Um, once my time in Chicago came to an end, I decided to move my family back to Los Angeles where I grew up. I was born in New York city, lived in New York till I was 10. My mom moved my brother and I to LA. That's where I went to middle school and high school left for, for 10 plus years for football came back and, uh, really had no idea who I was, Mm -hmm. you know, without the game, had no idea how to relate to anyone, how to have a conversation, how to do anything. I had no real applicable skills for creating a business or doing anything outside of putting this armor on Mm -hmm. and going out and willing my my rage on other people, on other men. And um, that became apparent really quickly. You know, every relationship that I had was going through the lens of me being this professional athlete Mm -hmm. for so long. So I had no tools for relating. I had no tools, like I said, for business or making money outside of playing football. I'd never had a real job before. So I felt like a fish out of water for lack of a better term, uh, to the utmost, you know, even more than that, um, you know, coming around being around people, guys who have left professional sports and are, are, uh, begin the journey of attempting to live a normal life. It's, uh, it feels as though you were on this cruise ship and you got thrown off in the middle of the ocean. Mm -hmm without a life preserver Mm -hmm. and you just have to find your way to land (laughs) and uh, it can be really difficult and it's really it was really difficult for me it was not a it was not a an easy transition and luckily you know i hit around 2016 i hit complete rock bottom where my life was completely crashing over me. The, the alcohol, the weed, the porn, all the escape valves were no longer working for me. Two hours in the weight room wasn't giving me the relief that it once did. And I had to really take a look at the man in the mirror Mm. and make a decision about who I was going to be and how I was going to start living, you know, and that started with asking for help for me really started with saying, Hey, I don't have the tools required for living a sustainable life. And so that culminated over dinner with my mom and my brother and my aunt. And they just started talking about our family history of alcoholism. And there's tools for this, this thing that this ailment, this disease that our family struggles with. And that starts with 12 step programs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I found my way into a men's, uh, an all men's Al-Anon meeting, Al-Anon for the families of alcoholics. AA is for the alcoholics, Al-Anon for the families of alcoholics. And it's always said in Al-Anon, if you're looking to distinguish or discern the difference in AA, it's a drinking disease and Al-Anon, it's a thinking disease. Mm. So my thinking had really become unmanageable. My codependency, my people pleasing, my need to essentially make sure everybody in my life is okay and doing well before I can experience any joy or peace or relief. And Mm -hmm. that becomes just a completely unmanageable cycle, you know? So I found my way into this men's meeting that my brother had been going to in LA Excuse me. And um, I walked in there totally cloaked in shame, guilt, darkness, heaviness. Felt like I hadn't taken a deep breath in probably my entire life. Mm -hmm. And sit down. This lead speaker starts sharing about his childhood. And it was as if he was telling the story of my life. And I just burst into tears and I probably spent the next hour crying and my heart just blew open. The clouds parted, sun came down, the whole thing. 
And I walked out of that room feeling hopeful, feeling like I could take a deep breath for the first time in my entire life and feeling like I could do this thing. Mm -hmm. You know, I could, I could start, I was starting, the light was just coming in through the cracks enough for me to recognize that I could start putting the pieces back together of who am I in this life after football? And, uh, from there it, the journey took many, many turns. I mean, I found my way back to therapy, which led me into meditation, which led me back to my childhood. I mean, my mom was taking my brother and I to yoga classes from the time I was 10 years old. Hmm. And that had always been a through line in our family. My mom's a, a master body worker, somatic healer, yogini, and um, finding my way back to that discipline was really important for me in identifying who I was outside of this persona as a warrior. Um, <clears throat> so it brought me back to yoga. I met two incredible, very important mentors for me, two men, Kirk and Joshua, shout out to you guys who were instrumental in simply showing me the way back to myself. They, they brought me into a handful of plant medicine ceremonies combo and ayahuasca and introduced me to Hape and these, these tools that allow us to peel back the layers. Um, And it was just a day by day process of recognizing that the thing I'd been seeking my entire life was peace Mm. and love and acceptance and allowance for myself. You know, even this weekend just hosted our fourth heal and flow event, my yoga retreat. And, um, the theme of the weekend that it was a great reminder for me because I think with the influence of social media and society and culture, and even in this wellness realm, there's so much information, you know, and there's constantly, we become slaves to the machine and having to produce more and more content, which isn't always necessarily suited or even necessary for the grand scheme. It's like, we're just trying to find stuff to talk about at this point. I feel like, or at least I feel like that because it really comes down to this thing for me of when are you going to stop abandoning yourself for the sake of another person or a job or a situation or something that's going on in your life that you can mentally validate or legitimize through explanation or through rationalization. They love me. Mm. There's a, there's bliss here. There's money here. This is how I live X, Y, Z. But meanwhile, walking around abandoning the, the overriding sensation of this is not for me or this isn't working for me in my life. And the whole journey for me has been coming to a place of trusting that internal sense, that inner sense of what's happening inside of me, that feeling, that gut instinct, that intuitive knowing that says, you know what, this isn't working for me anymore. Mm -hmm. And allowing that voice, that inner sense to be cultivated rather than suppressed and repressed and shunned into the dark because it doesn't quite make sense according to the, the external things that we are so often seduced into choosing over choosing for, because it's like, that makes sense to keep that job or to stay in that relationship or X, Y, Z, you know, these things that we do over and over in our lives for various, at various points for various reasons, rather than simply honoring ourselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so 
you know, for me, the journey coming out of football, even, even the, the warrior persona, I mean, there was this time where I wanted to just kill that part of myself. I wanted to completely bury it and run from it and say, no, that's not me. And yet it's so very much me and has been mm-hmm. such a, such an important part of my journey. So honoring that journey as that warrior, honoring little kid Ebb who did things and and had to do things to keep himself safe and had to do things that nobody else was willing to do to protect his mother and his brother and show up and be the young man that he had to be, you know? So, you know, all of that to say, the journey has been one of from chaos to peace Mm -hmm. and continues to be so, Mm -hmm. you know? The only way out is through, right? That's it, man. You had to go through it and it reminds me of, of uh, this quote that <clears throat> success is getting what you want and happiness is wanting what you get. Mm. And it sounds like by anybody's standards, you know, a kid growing up watching the football, like who wouldn't want that? Who wouldn't want to be the guy under the lights with the money and then with the fame and with everything that comes with it, the power and the girls and like, whoa, that would be amazing, <laughs> right? Absolutely. But then you get it and you're like, huh, hmm, still something not quite right here Mm. and then maybe that that was the thing that that led to the breakdown of i have to get out of this to the breakthrough of now i get to find what's really important because really what is important is how you feel when you're alone with yourself at the end of the day yeah yeah exactly um and the football was an incredible journey it was an incredible experience you know and there was a time where The, the big lesson was, hey, Eb, you did all this stuff, you achieved this immense goal, and you still felt incomplete. Mm-hmm. Now, that feeling really had more to do with where I was starting from than necessarily speaks to what football is mm-hmm. or what football was for me, you know? Uh, anything in life, if we go seeking anything in life as a, as a component of making us whole, we're going to be sorely disappointed. You know, it's that that thing of does money buy you happiness? And the answer is no. And yes, because if you're seeking the money to fill the hole, then you're obviously you're going to be disappointed at the end of the day when you realize, oh shit, I can't buy enough stuff mm-hmm. to feel happy all the time. Yeah, and money can make you feel really good. However, if your relationship with it is is in accordance with money as energy and money as this thing that sustains you and your family and brings security and stability, that's all good stuff but not as the thing itself, as the thing that's gonna provide you with happiness or fulfillment and anything like that. Mm -hmm. We go searching for that in partners. Mm -hmm. You know, we go searching for that in jobs and things and cars and stuff. And so if I had done it all over again with what I know now, perhaps I might've played a little longer recognizing like, hey, this is a great job to have rather than this is the thing that's going to save my life. Right. You know, and this is who I am and this is my entire identity. Exactly. Exactly. And, and rather getting into the spiritually sustainable relationship with it of this is a thing I do, not who I am. Mm -hmm. And so living from that place with anything, you know, that was, that was truly, that was the, that was the, ultimate lesson of it is Eb, whatever you do in your life. And I've had this over and over again with my podcasts, with wellness consulting, had this experience of, I'll tell you the story just, just because that, that explains it, that puts the context around what I'm trying to say, I think the best But I became the, the director of wellness for this cannabis company in Venice. And uh, I'd go into the office one or two days a week and I'd take the entire employee staff through yoga and breath work and 
Then I'd sit with everyone one-on-one and let them download whatever personal or professional things were going on in their life that they were struggling with. And going into that job, I felt like, this is it. This is it, man. I found it. This is, this is what I'm meant to be doing. And about six months into the gig, I found myself walking out the door one day a little bit crestfallen going, ah, I did it again. I did it again. Once again, I've come to the stark realization that it's never going to be about what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. It can never be about what I'm doing as far as feeling whole, feeling worthy, feeling of value in my life. It can never be about the thing that I'm doing. I have to just have that. Mm -hmm. I have to give myself that whether I'm sweeping floors or giving a Ted talk, you know, or playing in the NFL or leading people through breath work or leading yoga classes. Like it doesn't matter what I'm doing. That is never the thing that's going to bring me fulfillment and peace and joy in my heart that, that I'm seeking that I'm think it will, you know? And so, um, for me, it's just, it's become this journey of waking up every day and nourishing my heart, nourishing my soul through whatever it is that I'm calling for, be that rest, be that time in nature, be that time connecting with people, be that creating art, content, writing, whatever it might be, that's the doing part Mm -hmm. that actually has nothing to do with the only part that that has to do with me feeling fulfilled and whole is that that's what my spirit is calling for in Mm -hmm. that day, that moment, that breath. Um, and I think that's a, that's a, that is 100% a practice. That's something we never arrive at. You arrive at it through the doing it, Mm -hmm. through the correspondence with the heart sense, you know, rather than waking up and saying, because we do it all the time. You know, it's interesting how robotic we actually are. And I think it's interesting too, this, we have, there's this thing in the atmosphere of being terrified of AI and being terrified of artificial things. And yet we are very mechanical in our operating system. You know, everything that we are, for the most part, and this is one of the one of those things, it's a daily moment by moment practice of becoming mindful, becoming conscious, waking up, is getting out of the autopilot functioning system. Mm-hmm. And we do that all the time. Like you come out of football and I I start the I create for myself a an unbreakable daily routine. You know, I wake up in the morning, I do my breath work, I do my yoga, I meditate, I journal, I drink the glass of water, I do X, Y, and Z, and that becomes this necessary blueprint for me to be functioning throughout my day at my quote unquote optimal Mm -hmm. level, right? And then one day I find myself and I go, man, I'm fucking tired of this. I'm tired of waking up every day and doing the same thing day in and day out. It's boring. Now, while discipline is extremely important, being flexible and being aware enough to adjust as your spirit calls for, as your body calls for, as your, your heart and your, and your soul call for, that's a really necessary component of Mm -hmm. exercising your humanity to Mm -hmm. its fullest, you know? So, becoming mindful enough and aware enough to override the autopilot whenever it reveals itself because our, our mind, the, our nervous system is constantly trying to find the easiest way to move. It's built to survive, right? It's a miracle. Like this thing, this body is a fucking miracle. And not only is this body us, 
another thing that that's come up for me lately that's very alive for me lately is this in the in the it's funny to say these things i i always find it funny to say the spiritual community or the wellness community for me it's like we're living life mm-hmm. to the fullest mm-hmm. you know <laughs> it's a spiritual experience <laughs> this is the spiritual experience yeah. this physical experience is the spiritual experience we are the body like this is spirit manifested in a physical form mm-hmm. this is god manifested in physical form that's what this is and so to try to escape that or to allow it to run the show and our mind likes to run the show and if our mind's running the show as many spiritual gurus have have illuminated this the the mind is a tyrannical master but a wonderful servant mm-hmm. but it takes some time to get to the place where you can use your mind as that magical miraculous servant that it was built to be mm-hmm. rather than just cracking the whip and judging and criticizing and taking over the show and making you feel like there's always more to do because there will always be more to do. There's tons of work to be done. I mean, look at, look at where we are. I think we're in a, a true renaissance and, and human evolution currently with everything that's happening with regenerative agriculture, with our connection to nature in particular us becoming aware of our innate responsibility to be stewards of the planet rather than masters of it. Um, And I think that's happening all in this, this community of seekers, of people who are interested in the underlying workings of the mind, body, and spirit, our connection to earth, of breath work, of yoga, of everything that you guys are doing here at Heart and Soil, and everything that people like Paul Saladino are are bastions of this renaissance of human evolution where we're really stepping into a new phase of being Mm -hmm. and recognizing our deep connection in the ecosystem of the universe. Um, And that's a little bit of a tangent. However, for me, it feels totally connected because the peace goes hand in hand, finding that peace. Like I just moved here from Los Angeles, grew up in LA, Mm -hmm. loved LA for so long. LA was home. LA felt like this cradle of creativity. And at some point, that faded and all that I could feel being there was this immense electromagnetic static Mm -hmm. stressing my system. And I felt the shift where my spirit was just dying to get somewhere else and moving here getting out into the country, getting out into space, getting out into nature, waking up every day just surrounded by trees and green and land, being able to put my bare feet in the soil right outside the door, allowing my dog to run free and chase deer and you know, play with donkeys and all kinds of cool stuff like that that I never really thought about for myself. Mm-hmm. It's been this very organic journey to this and even driving here this morning i just thought to myself god i'm so blessed Mm -hmm. i'm so grateful to be here i feel so at home i feel so in my body i feel so free and all of that allows me to be more conscious to be more aware to be more mindful in everything that i do and the natural progression is towards nature. And I said this thing a long time ago, and maybe, maybe you agree with this, maybe you have some, some interesting thoughts of your own on this, but it feels as though in this moment of, of, of evolution that we're currently moving through, this divide, the great divide of some of humanity going deep into the, into the technology, 
with the Oculus and mm-hmm. the Apple Vision and mm-hmm. all of this stuff. And and then there's this whole other sect of humanity that's going deeper into nature and earth connection and spirit and natural. And for me, whichever way you go, it appears obvious that you're going to develop an immense distaste for the other, right? It's like if you go deep into the technology, camping out one night, under the stars in without a bathroom or a toilet or the bugs all the, the amenities, the bugs and the trees and all the stuff out there. You think, why in the hell would I want to do that? And on the other side, you go deeper into nature. And for me, it's like Apple vision. Why the fuck would I want to walk around with this thing glued to my head? That's right. going to just give me a headache. Yeah, have you seen a tree? They're <laughs> you <know>? great. <laughs> yeah, they're amazing. Have you ever listened to the birds? Yeah, it's, it's, awesome. it's spectacular. Um, and so for me, the peace and the clarity go hand in hand with this wave of evolution that, that I I'm on. And I feel like a, a, a large amount of human beings are moving into, which is connection to, to the earth yeah. connection, to nature. Um, I think like this, this ten, I, cause I agree. And I feel the tension and you said you, you've used, um, a couple of pertinent times there where you've said like this way of being, and this is a new way of being. And I think it's fundamentally the tension of the human doing like the robot yes. becoming extensions of the robot with the glasses, with the tech, with the eye watch, with everything that's becoming robotic. The life yeah. is robotic. The thoughts are robotic. The mind is churning. The ego is running the show versus the human being who yes. we actually are. We yes. forgot, you know, we've just become the human totally, doing. Man. There's always too much to do, totally. but like, what if we be then, then that's where that voice comes up, you know, like, Peter Crone, I don't know if you're familiar with him, but he's, he's great. You'd love him. And I he know says, him. You can never, nothing outside of you can ever make, make up for an internal sense of lack you perceive yourself to be. And that's kind that's of exactly like, what I've just been trying to say. Bingo. And that's exactly. why he's got this, these one liners that you're like, yes, that's yes, the thing. And you exactly have to like it. find it. And then you find the peace, you find the human being and you realize that, oh, what this is really about is me n- fixing that sense of lack and uh, what are you drawn to to fix that you're usually drawn to things like nature to stillness to prayer to meditation to honoring the way of our ancestors and i think that's beautiful and i agree there is a diverging paths here and Mm. i hope that more people want to lean into what feels much more hopeful to me much more natural and much more about healing and coming back to self Mm. i would say hope so as well however i do know that it is all perfect Mm. you know it's all perfect man and whatever it's meant to be is meant to be and will happen and the best thing that we can do is live the example Mm -hmm. you know be the change you wish to see in the world exactly I mean, it's, it's, so, it's so simple and, and people will find their way for me. I had the beautiful grace of hitting complete rock bottom. I hated who I saw in the mirror. It was literally kill myself or change. Mm. That was, that was the, that was the crux of my transformation. And in the Vedic arc of transformation, it begins with chaos. You have to be in utter chaos. And as one of my my great mentors said, in this life, Ebb, or in general, we can change through two mechanisms, insight or pain. And it seems as though in this dimension, in the realm that we find ourselves in, at least when you're in, when you're at a certain plane of consciousness in the material mechanism, in the material way of being, way of doing, pain is the necessary vehicle for you to transform, to change. And then you get to a certain place where you can change through insight. Mm-hmm. You can, it can be more gentle. You don't have to have the big implosion, explosion to go, okay, God, I'm listening. 
Fine. I'll change. I'll do it differently. I see that my ways are destroying me. Yes. Right? Because it starts with chaos, then it comes into acceptance. You have to accept. You have to come into that place where you go, yep, yeah, that's it. I see. This way is no longer serving me. My life has become completely unmanageable. I get it. The next step, new behavior in relationship to. So you develop new habits. You start taking new actions in relationship to a community of people. In relationship to a new discipline. In relationship with something new. And then on the other side of that is this new form emerges. But it always begins with chaos. And my mom says this all the time. When people come to her and they're in complete turmoil, they're in chaos, she says, congratulations. Yeah, you're close. (laughs) Here we go. This is where the good stuff starts. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think if, if we can have... If more people can have courage to be in the midst of that chaos and recognize it as this offering from God, the universe, an offering from God and or the universe, whichever you prefer, to change, to transform, to do it better, to step into a new reality. You know, COVID whatever your feelings are about it, it was a complete portal for all of us. Mm -hmm. You stepped through that COVID portal, man, and it became really clear where people were at. Really clear. One side or the other, whichever it is, whatever you believe in, it became unavoidably clear where you stood stepping through that COVID portal. And it was an offering. It was an opportunity for us to look at what we're doing, how we're living, and is that how we want to continue on? It was a global meditation in a way because it was the first time in my lifetime where the whole world was forced to sit and stop for a moment, stop doing the human doing thing. (laughs) Really incredible. some people got the insight. Mm. Some people heard the phone ring in and they picked it up and they got the message and they were able to walk through that and see and question other people just double down, you know, Mm -hmm. but it was really profound and it it seems to have added fuel to the fire of the division that has arose from that. And that's the, that's the growing pains, right? There is no growth without these growing pains along the way. This change is uncomfortable change of like completely dissolving your persona and identity as a football player to like, Oh, who the fuck am I Mm. without that? You know, it's, it's uncomfortable. And some people can't find the courage, like you said, to lean into that, to understand that it might feel like you're going backwards sometimes, but it's like a slingshot. It feels like it's going backwards, but it's harnessing energy to shoot forward if Absolutely. you alchemize it in that way. If not, it's going to bury you. You're going to numb. You go to the video games. You go to the porn. You go to the worshiping of our credentialed leaders of like, yes, I'll do this, and yes, I'll take this, and yes, tell me what slot <laughs> to eat, and yes, master. <laughs> or you become the alchemist. You know, You become free, sovereign individual. Amen. That's it right there. Amen, brother. Amen. And a lot of times on your point of the slingshot, you're gathering that energy. It feels like you're going backwards or you look around and you've made a decision and your whole life is falling apart. That's that same thing. You're praying for change. You're praying for change. And your life just starts falling apart, unraveling at the seams, everything around you, your relationships, your job, it all goes away. The money in your bank account, it all goes away. And you look up and you go, God, what the fuck? God's like, dude, you asked for change. You asked for a new life. We can't go on in this environment that you're living in. We have to change the environment. We have to obliterate everything that stands and start new. Mm Mm-hmm. Because the foundation has to be rebuilt of what you're asking for. Mm -hmm. And if you're able to stay in it, because that's that, that's the ultimate yoga right there. That's the yoga of life is, are you able to maintain peace in the midst of that chaos, maintain focus, concentration, trust, and faith? You can either have faith or be in total fear looking into the unknown. Mm -hmm. Either one. It's on the precipice of the unknown. You have to either have faith and trust that when you let go, 
God's going to provide you with the next thing. Or you're in total fear and you never go anywhere and you never see what's on the other side of that thing. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times you've got to be willing to let go of what's happening in front of you or what is in front of you in order to get to what's really meant for you. It's a leap of faith, not a leap of guarantee. Exactly, right? dude. <laughs> Rumi, uh, Rumi had the quote, leap, and then the net shall appear. It exactly. wasn't leap because there's a safety net and it's going to catch you and it's all going to be sunshine and rainbows. So don't worry about it. Just go. Exactly. It was like, no, leap first and trust. Yes. But it's hard. It's hard for people it's to hard. do. It's very hard. Probably the hardest thing. Right. The hardest thing. What have you really come to learn about your own mind and, you know, mastering, turning that into a, uh, you know, a servant to you instead of being a slave to the mind, the ego that loves its fear narratives. Mm. You know, it loves it. It doesn't care about you thriving. It just wants you surviving. That's super fear based. Yeah. How have you took your power back over that? What do you do? In the darkest of times, you've got to pour on the good. You've got to continue to pour on the good, pour in, pour on the gratitude, stay in that, stay in the goodness, stay in the faith, stay in the miracle of it, especially when it looks really dark. Moving here, the place that we found was a complete God revelation for me. Our lease in Los Angeles was coming to an end in October. We had made the decision we wanted to, to move out here around August. We came to visit some of our dear friends here and we were out at Krause Springs and I thought to myself, why not? Let's just try it. Try one year, move out here. Just try it for one year. Started looking on Zillow. There's a lot available in the, in the Austin area, this, in the hill country area. I really wanted to be in hill country out in space. This, this is the vision that's been growing in my mind for probably the last two or three years and lease in Los Angeles was ending in October had no idea where we were going next and one day I get a text from a dear friend of mine who says hey Eb, uh, I'm gonna be traveling out of the country for the next two months do you know anybody who would want to stay at my place Hey, this guy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. That's me. I'll take that. Uh, so God reveals, it reveals the next move. Part one. We're there. We're, we're, you know, getting through the end of the year, there's school. My daughter's in sixth grade. It's, you know, just like starting to, <sighs> think about, okay, what's next? I'm also working on building a business. I'm, I'm doing all sorts of things. Looking on Zillow, there's nothing quite there. We know that around January, we want to make the move. And that's when we have to be out of this house. And it was probably the end of October. And I look at my partner and I go, I don't know if I'm totally insane, but I am just completely in faith and trust that God's going to show us the next move. The next day, just about the next day, I get on the phone with a good buddy of mine who, who lives in Austin. He lives in Dripping Springs, actually. And I tell him, hey, man, made the decision, want to move out to Hill Country want to move out around January. He goes, Hey, remember Jenny from the yoga ranch? She's getting ready to move and is looking for somebody to take over her position, managing this property and doing events and living there. Uh, do you want me to connect you with her? I said, yep. Would love that. Thank you. Get connected with Jenny. Jenny's already found somebody, but she says, Hey, my best friend down the road has a similar setup as looking for somebody to come wow. in, do events, live on the property, manage the property. I'll connect you with her. Get connected with her. We're out here before Thanksgiving on the property, having dinner with the property owner, Melinda, wonderful woman who's also witchy and spiritual psychologist and leads retreats executive retreats on creativity and it's in perfect alignment has been calling in someone to do this for her and with her. And my lady and I wake up 
the morning after our first night staying in the in the in the beautiful renovated barn house looking out at the property going fuck this happened like that and it was all god man it was all trust i thought to myself i didn't even do anything here i just trusted and had faith and picked up the phone and spoke my desire out into the universe and here we are and there were many times where I'm sure everybody was looking at me going, what the fuck is Zeb? Mm. Is Zeb going to do something? Is Zeb going to move there? Because we have that thing, right? Our ego wants to creep in and we got to fix it. We got to make it happen. We got to have the, the solid concrete answer right here, right now. And my way of being has truly been to, for better or worse, let go of that over and over again. Surrender it to God. Hold the vision in my heart. This is the vision. This is the life that we're creating. This is what we're going for. Yes, we could have moved to an apartment in Austin somewhere and done city to city living. And yeah, it would have been a, a nice change, but it wouldn't be what we really want and what we really desire. Hold fast to the vision. Trust, 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 have faith. Believe it, know it, keep speaking your desires out into the universe, prayer, affirmation. When it feels like it couldn't possibly be any darker, that's the moment, man. The light comes through. The answer reveals itself. God makes the shit happen. There's so much happening that's unseen that we can't even be conscious of. We can't be conscious of it. But you have to trust. And in the dark times, that's when it's vitally important for you to hold fast to that truth and that faith because that's the difference maker. It's easy to be in trust and faith when everything's good. Mm -hmm. Easy. We can all do that. Mm -hmm. You know, when shit gets really dark and seems totally uncertain and the ego just wants to flare with doubt and judgment, and all these ideas about what's going wrong, what's going right, what's going right. It takes a lot of, it takes time. This stuff happens on God's time. You know, we make plans, God laughs. We know this. We know this. So following that instinct, that intuition, that intuitive knowing, that inner sense, learning how to trust that cultivating your relationship with that over and over again, even when it feels so terrifying. That's the key. There's no magic pill. There's no easy remedy. That's the yoga right there, mm. you know? And that's when discipline comes into play, having discipline, keeping yourself sharp mm -hmm. mentally and physically through your daily practices. It's vitally important and keep moving with purpose and trust and have faith. I, I'm glad you've raised that last point because I think that may be a missing piece for some people. Mm. They think that they can make the ask, they can send in the universal request <laughs> form and then it doesn't come back and they're like, well, well, that's great for you, Eben. It worked out, but it didn't work for me. So what's going on there? There's this idea that like I can manifest things, I can say affirmations <laughs> yeah, in the mirror and I'll yeah. just have it. It's more like when I do this, what I'm going to get is opportunities to show that I am actually worthy of receiving it. Yes. So how do you square that circle of this deep surrender experiment, this deep sense of trust and also being worthy of it through your actions as in alignment with it, as a conduit for it? Like how do you treat yourself and your body and your routines, like the discipline, with the level of respect it deserves so that you are a clear channel, so that when you cast those messages, when you make those asks, they are being received in a very kind of pertinent way. Mm. Yeah, I love that. Well, I think that wherever we are, whoever we are, purifying and strengthening the body is of the utmost importance and has been that for me. Um, so my physical fitness, doing something active with my body every day is a no, it's a non-negotiable. Mm -hmm. It's just a, I'm gonna lift weights, I'm gonna do yoga, I'm gonna go for a, an incredibly long walk, 
I'm going to hike. I'm going to get my heart rate up. I'm going to sweat every single day, non-negotiable. Um, breathing, your connection to your breath, vitally important. Obviously, we're all walking around breathing every day. Are you breathing correctly? That's actually a super valid mm-hmm. and important question. Are you walking around with your mouth open, breathing in and out of your mouth shallowly into the top of your chest? You're probably walking around in a low state of fight or flight constantly. Your amygdala is just on hyperdrive. You're pumping too much cortisol and adrenaline and other stress hormones. And so how could you possibly have the capability, the capacity to be patient or to put out any vibration or frequency with integrity if you're in that constant state of fear. Exactly. Nervous system fear, sympathetic fear. Just as a human animal, that's the the wave that you're in if you're not breathing properly. Mm -hmm. So developing your relationship with your breath, breathing in and out of your nose, doing breath work, even to a small extent, you know, whether it's Wim Hof or simple breath holds, super powerful for you to just connect with your breath to start modulating your nervous system into that, keeping you in that more balanced state, even if it's tweaked a little bit towards the parasympathetic, that rest, digest, recover, detoxify, turning on the prefrontal cortex, center of executive decision making. If that's not turned on, if there's no blood flow, no oxygen into that area of your brain, how are you supposed to make valid decisions ever Mm -hmm. in your life. So purifying my body, keeping my brain healthy through nutrition, through hydration, you know, food is how I, I nourish my body through nutrition, the food that I eat super basic. I mean, I am probably animal based. I guess you could call it that at this point. Um, it's very, it's very protein centric animal protein centric. I eat a lot of red meat, eat a lot of bison. Chicken's a good change up. Fish, eh, not so much. Um, Fruit, vegetables, fermented veggies. These are staples. Uh, Raw dairy, if I'm having dairy, raw cheese, love raw heavy cream in my Mm -hmm. coffee. Um, and then a handful of really potent supplements, Shilajit, heart and soil, organ supplements, um, getting enough magnesium. These are, these are things that I focus on. So keeping my body strong and vibrant and healthy through movement and food and breath is vitally important to keeping the instrument tuned. Mm. This is the instrument, dude. Mm. This is the instrument for you to connect with God and the universe, right? And so if if your instrument is out of tune, how are you going to send a proper signal Mm -hmm. to source? So then to your question of this idea, a book that I highly recommend to anybody is is a book by Bob Proctor. You can listen to an audio book, Change Your Paradigm, Change Your Life. And he talks a lot about this. And so thought... Thought is a very high vibrational frequency. It all begins with thought. And so the thoughts are really important. What thoughts are we giving energy and attention to? We have millions of thoughts a day, right? Maybe there's an exact number. Maybe it's not that many. I feel like for me, it could be millions of thoughts in a day. (laughs) I think they say it's 50,000. 50,000. 50,000 is a lot. It's it's overwhelming. It's an overwhelming amount of thoughts that we have in a day. So... One of my favorite quotes is from Buckminster Fuller, and it's in his book, uh, A Guide to Spaceship Earth or something like that, a, 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 man, a field guide to operating spaceship Earth. Really interesting book. But it starts out with a preface by one of his students who picked him up to take him to the airport one day, and Buckminster got in the car and he said to him, John... What's the most important thing we could be thinking about for the next 30 minutes on this drive to the airport? And I love that idea. Like, what is the most important thing we can be thinking about right now? 
so many times we have ju- we're just lost in completely nonsensical thinking, things that have nothing to do with anything important in our lives. And we spend so much time and energy on it. Imagine if you really focused and concentrated your, your thought power, your thinking power on things that could elevate your life, right? So the thoughts, what types of thoughts are you having? And I have to say, in this conversation, it's important for me to, to explain that, again, your mind is this infinitely powerful tool, and yet many of us don't use it properly. And for me, it took purifying my body to get to the place where I recognized my, I had to get right in my heart, reconcile in my heart, before I could even start to utilize my mind as this magnificent tool that it is. And I think that's just started to happen. Yeah, right. Truly. Like, I think I've only just started to tap into the miraculous power of my mind. Because I was, there were so many barriers and blockages and nonsense and divergences that I had to work through and release before I could actually start to use my mind in a way that serves me in my life. Um, and so, you know, and I think there's also in, in, in the spiritual journey, there's this thing of get out of your mind and into your heart. And while I think that's an important, that's an important journey to take, the next step is how are we using our mind? Yeah, integrate them, right? You know, so what are the thoughts that we're thinking, giving energy and attention to? What are we spending time thinking about? Now, using your mind to visualize the future or the, excuse me, the, the life of our dreams, which we have to take from the thought form and bring it into our body and feel it in our body. Imagine yourself, I do this exercise with my, with my students all the time. You, just, you can do this any moment. You just close your eyes. Take a deep breath in. On your exhale, just let everything go. Just let all the tension in your body go. Just get heavier, get into gravity. And then call to mind a vision of yourself in your highest greatness. A vision of yourself in your highest form, totally fulfilled, totally content, surrounded by people that love you and support you, smiling, joyous, free, in the home of your dreams, with all the things you've ever dreamed of all that you've ever hoped to achieve, all the successes, it's already here, you've done it, you've accomplished it, mission complete. Feel what it feels like to drink your coffee in the morning. Feel what it feels like to have your feet on the ground in that reality. What does it feel like in your body? And so you take this map that you build of your life in its highest form and you bring your awareness to it day in, day out, morning and night. And then something really incredible starts to happen because you start to, you start to change your subconscious belief matrix Mm -hmm. about what your life is. And then through that, you become inspired to take new actions. You become inspired to do new things, to set up new habits in your life that are going to start to put you on the trajectory of manifesting that reality. And that's the missteps that I think those who say, well, I, I asked for this and I didn't get it, Eb. It's like, yeah, well, it takes a whole lot more than just thinking about it. You've got to be about it. Mm. It was like me playing in the NFL. Looking back, I had this incredible realization how I unconsciously manifested that reality. 
And it was because I woke up from the time I was 13 years old until I was 21 when I was drafted in the NFL. Every day I woke up and I was in the NFL. How I lived, how I breathed, how I walked, how I talked, how I ate, how I trained, how I moved. It was all as NFL ebb. Mm. And then I realized it. And that took 10 years, eight years. That took eight years, which is actually miraculously fast. Mm -hmm. And so anything that we're doing in our lives, and it can happen faster. It can happen faster than that, whatever it is. And the, the quick, the quick and the quickness of that transformation is really about the concentration of your energy, Mm. how concentrated and focused is your energy from the thought into the body, into your actions, your daily habits and behaviors. And sometimes it takes that reconditioning, right? Because we might come from a family that's built on scarcity and lack and unworthiness And who are you to be big? Who are you to be successful? And we have to rewrite that whole code. Mm -hmm. And that takes some work. That takes some reflection. That takes some serious self-study. To know thyself is the ultimate game. And that's really the prerequisite for anything we want to do in life. Like how well do you know yourself? Mm -hmm. How deeply in touch with all of it, the good, the bad, the ugly, all the stuff that we think is unacceptable or not okay or that we want to run away from being good with all of that because that acceptance of that self is the ultimate foundation for you becoming the person you're destined to be. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I answered the question, but Uh, no, I love it, dude. I think, you know, the, it brings up a few things. The The day you plant the seed is not the day you eat the fruit. You yes. Know, sometimes it's going to take percent. eight years, 10 years, sometimes a couple of months. But you're describing something I'd say a lot. It's like a Steiner principle. It's head, heart, hands. Mm, and it's mm. that that integration and this this journey of a, of a person's lifetime can be the longest journey of the lifetime. You yeah. know, to integrate the space between the head and the heart, those 12 inches is a lot of navigating. And once they're finally in some sort of coherence, then the hands come in, then the habits, then Mm. the change, then the actions, the right action, the aligned actions. And then you'll be living something that feels like a dream, but you're, you're so right too. You have to believe it. It's the cliche, whether you think you can or you can't, you are right. If you can't even allow yourself to see a more compelling future for yourself, then guess what? You are never going to see it and you will be right. And that's self-righteousness in a nutshell. (laughs) Good job. You believed you're a failure. You are. Congratulations. How does that feel? Perfect. Or you can go for more, you know, you can go for more. You can dream big. Mm. You you have to, Mm -hmm. you have to, because there's, there's nothing else we've got. We all, all have to be somewhat delusional. And doesn't it make sense to have a hopeful, trusting, loving delusion about the future of what's mm. possible and then match that with your actions today? Be worthy of it. I think that's powerful, man. I Absolutely. Powerful. You know, knowing all of this that you know now about the mind, about the body, about nutrition in a theoretical parallel universe, if you could go back to the football days, how do you think it would change your football career? It's a, it's a really good question. And I think it would have only, it's an interesting thought experiment because I feel it could, it could either, it could go one of two ways. Either I never would have played football (laughs) or I would have played for 20 years, Yeah, you know? And I always think about this, just how I use the cold tub now compared to how I used it as a, as a football player. I mean, back then I'd get in up to my waist and I'd be in for 10 minutes rather than now. I wish I had done it how I do it now, get in for three to five minutes up to my neck, you know, and just feel so much more revitalized and get the inflammation out of my entire body rather than just out of my hips, knees and ankles, and maybe not even do it that effectively mm-hmm. because I'm not getting my heart under. Um, but knowing what I know now and also I got to have something to do. So mm-hmm. maybe I would have played football and it, it, I would have just been a much, a much deeper athlete, you know, and yeah. looked at it as a, 
as a samurai or mm. as as some sort of spiritual warrior, you know. Um, and that could have been really fun. I had some of that. You know, this guy was here. Yeah, right. This guy was here. Uh, not quite to the extent. I was also functioning on a very heavy paradigm of unworthiness then. You know, my whole football career was a mission of proving myself right. to the world rather than just a mission of doing what I love to do. I loved football because it was a place for me to unleash this rage inside on other human beings and be celebrated for right, it. Right. It wasn't because I loved the grind, you know? Um, so it's an interesting question. Uh, I think big picture, it would have only served me for my highest good to have this knowing and also it was it was it made this journey possible yeah, it was perfect you know it was totally perfect yeah. and to your point of that journey from the head to the heart as being a lifetime journey for some people for all of us to some extent mm -hmm. you know maybe it happens when you're 30 maybe it happens when you're 75 mm -hmm. whenever it happens maybe it's on your deathbed and that idea of how many li lifetimes we live is if your if your soul's journey was the size of a mountain and every day a stork flew by with a handkerchief and just grazed the top of a mountain and the amount of time it would take for that stork to fly by and wear the mountain down to the flat earth that's how many lives we've lived perhaps one lifetime going from the head to the heart that's a massive journey in and of itself and maybe mm -hmm. that's just that's the that's the lifetime that we lived mm -hmm. that one you know um and then the next one we get to be the the spiritual master on the mountaintop, again, you know, <laughs> need to do it all again. I have to ask you this one just because, um, it's a fun one to close with and it uh, brings in another chapter of your journey. Mike Tyson uh -huh. versus, was it Jake, Jake Paul? Paul, Mike Tyson versus <laughs> oh, Jake Paul. If you're a betting man who you throw oh, in the cashola God. down, God, it's crazy. Huh? <laughs> so crazy. What a, what a sign of the times. Um, you know, when you ask it that way, who am I putting my money on? I feel like the whole thing is just a money grab anyway, oh, yeah. and it's all predetermined one way or another. So it's got a WWE vibe to it. I right? don't know how, you, yeah, I don't know how you would. I'm sure there are people fucking betting on it. Oh, no you doubt. Know? <laughs> there are people betting on it. And I, uh, and, uh, and people are getting really emotionally involved because for, for many, Mike is their childhood hero right. and an absolute demigod of American slash world history. Yep. Um, and then to see him getting in the ring with this caricature who one of the last episodes of hot box and I did was with Jake Paul. Oh, no way. Oh, interesting. And he was getting ready to fight Nate Robinson. Mm. So it was before this whole thing kind of started. And I think a few things. One, I think Jake Paul is very talented. He's immensely talented as a fighter. And I think he's surprised just about everyone yep. in the world to about his level of expertise and his commitment to this to fighting and whatever you want to say about all the fights that he's had they're all ufc guys he lost to the one only true boxer mm -hmm. tommy fury he's gotten in the ring with guys who are kind of past it. old and the uber yeah. driver was his last opponent yeah, yeah and past their their determined days and whatever you want to say about it 
he's he knocked out a lot of guys in in pretty uh, stellar fashion. He Honestly, can box, he can sure. box, you know, and he trains hard. You yeah. watch him; he trains yeah. hard. And sitting with him in that interview, I could tell the kid had a, a shitload of determination yeah. and desire. Like he wants to do this. Yeah. Now, taking all of that and then saying you're gonna get in the ring with Mike Tyson, who's a fifty. 57, will be, I think. Will be, Something yeah, like 55 to 57 by the time the fight happens. I just think, what does that do for your credibility? I don't think it really serves you in any mm. way. It's sort of like a video game, like who in the history of the world would you want to fight? And you have this opportunity yeah. to fight this, yeah. this mega world champion, Mike Tyson, who's a legend. And and I love Mike to death. I mean, I think it. I think he's having fun with it, probably, and it's a good opportunity for him to to collect a, a large amount of money. Oh yeah, he's gonna do <laughs> uh, okay on that. So I'm I'm am re- happy for him in that, and it's and he's. I know he's having fun with it. Um, you know, dude, it, it's such a weird time we live in. What a circus it's it a, is. That's the perfect word in it's my mind. I was like, it's a circus. circus. Yeah. It's really crazy that we're in this place where a YouTuber is fighting a legendary world heavyweight boxer. Yeah, it's wild. It's just like, this is where we live, man. Trump has been president, might be president again. God willing, Bobby Kennedy gets in there. Bobby. Uh, which I have to say this because Bobby was was one of the best hotboxing episodes we ever did. He was a guest on Hotboxing, and YouTube erased that episode. They don't like that guy, man. Which is really sad. Um, and, you know, politics aside, corporate uh, interests aside, Bobby Kennedy is an absolute champion of the people, and uh, God bless him. And, uh, you know... God bless us all, dude. You know? <laughs> it's a really, it's a good point to put a period on this conversation simultaneously, like you said before. It's all perfectly imperfect. It's crazy. It's funny. It feels like a clown circus world sometimes. And there is also hope. There are these yes. figures that can impact change. You and I, yeah. all we can do, it's the old Ram Dass quote, all I can do for, for you is work on myself. Mm-hmm. All you can do for me is work on yourself. Absolutely. All we can try and do for the collective is to live that example. You know, you can lead the horse to water, you can't make it drink, but you can make it very curious. Absolutely. You can make it very like, what, what's Ebenon? Because I like some of that and I want some of that and I'm going to try some of that. So I appreciate you, man. I appreciate your message. I appreciate your energy, your vibe. Where can people go to keep up with you and where can they find your podcast and were you making moves on the old social media circus game these days? Where's <laughs> yeah. all that stuff? Uh, on Instagram at EDS Britain. That's, that's really the main hub. My website, ebonbritain.com. Um, my podcast, The Ebb and Flow, available on all streaming platforms. If you love my message, you love what I'm all about, you want to go deeper, you could join my group mentorship program, Life and Flow, and all the information for that is available on Instagram. Thank you, brother. It's been a fun one. Yeah, appreciate it. Thank you very much. Woo! Fam, stay woke, the good kind. (laughs) (laughs) See you next time. Peace out. All right, friends, thanks for tuning in to another episode of Radical Health Radio. We got a fresh new podcast for you every Wednesday. If you enjoyed the show, consider liking, subscribing, reviewing, and rating us on your podcast platform. It helps to spread this message of radical health. We'll see you next week.